<sighs> Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And uh, I might want to turn that down just a little. Uh, and thank you very much to the uh, Institute for inviting me here and uh, to the New Zealand Film Commission who have assisted me uh, getting here today. Uh, so this is only uh, the second time I've ever done something like this. The first time was about three days ago uh, where I spoke to the, at the Young Leaders Forum. Uh, and uh, I was very confused when I first got the email from Mark. I uh, assumed it was a joke. Um, I thought someone was having me on. I w couldn't figure out why uh, anyone would want me to come to Berlin to talk about cultural diplomacy. Uh, I really didn't know what cultural diplomacy meant. Uh, so I've had a good look into it, and I uh, prepared I, what I thought was a good speech on cultural diplomacy. Uh, since I've been here over the last few days, I've uh, heard some pretty amazing speeches uh, on cultural diplomacy and uh, spend a bit of time looking around this incredible city uh, and consequently have thrown my speech out. Uh, hence, this is the title of my lecture uh, because I don't think it's going to be a lecture. Uh, I figure we've got some pretty amazing people here speaking and um, from the time I spent uh, here the last couple of days, some pretty amazing people here just to listen as well. Uh, so I've had to think about it, and I think that my place here and uh, what I can offer is, uh, well, basically just to introduce you to me and my country and my culture, a little bit of my work. Uh, yeah, it was very humbling to listen to Andreas talking. Um, you know, film is a director's medium. Uh, Theatre is often considered a, uh, an actor's medium. And in film, yeah, that's my screensaver, isn't it? I bought my own Mac. It's the second time I've ever used PowerPoint as well, and I'm aware that uh, a lot of you people know what you're doing, so just forgive me for that as well. Um, so I'm a professional actor. That means I'm a storyteller, uh, and I'm a trained uh, storyteller. So um, what I'm going to do today is pretty much just tell you a whole bunch of stories. Um, I'll leave the, uh, the analysis uh, up to other people and... If I can achieve one thing today, hopefully I can uh, offer some inspiration, some ideas from my part of the world that may be relevant to some of you. It may not. Um, regardless, I'm having a great time in Berlin, so um, <laughs> thank you for having me here. Uh, okay. I thought, yeah, I should introduce you to some of my work. Uh, and uh, I could show you um, bits of films. I could uh, talk about some of my theatre. I thought the easiest way to introduce you to my work is just to uh, show you my showreel. A showreel is, a, uh, is unfortunately some of the least interesting stuff I've done, but it's uh, like a calling card. Actors make these things called showreels where you put clips of your work and you give them to uh, people who might be able to give you a job. Uh, so I'll show you mine and I'll talk about some of the things in it. It's kind of film, it's screen work, obviously, uh, and it's mostly New Zealand. There's a little bit of Australian and uh, British work that I've done as well, uh, but it may give us something to talk about. I'll try not to talk too long because I think the discussion part might be more interesting uh, for us. Okay, so here's my showreel. We've got no sound. Oh, hello. Well, there we go. Uh, yeah, I really know my way around the kitchen that well. <laughs> that doesn't help. Uh, so this is a New Zealand TV show called The Cult hey, um, that, uh, strangely, is very, very popular in South America. Uh, yeah. I could show you if you like. Show you your way around the kitchen if you like. Yeah. All right. I want my mind back. Uh, okay, so that piece um, I put in there because it, uh, it shows, oh, look, he can be a nice uh, romantic uh, leading um, person who can looks nice, um, you know, with a girl. So, uh, you know. <laughs> That's uh, to encourage TV, people who make TV, to go, oh, how lovely, isn't he got a nice face? So you put that at the start, especially if you're giving it to Americans. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's called The Cult, and it was a, uh, uh, we have a, an interesting, strangely in New Zealand, we have a, seems to be a, a number of these strange rural cults that have happened over the years, people who retreat into the bush and uh, make their own rules. Uh, we've had a few of them over the years, quite famous ones. Uh, 
they never get too violent. It's not Jonestown or anything. But we um, we made a television show about uh, about a cult, a specific cult. I played a founding member of this cult. Um, yeah, and so that was that's what that was. I'll just explain a little bit as we go. Uh, this next piece is from a film called I'm Not Harry Jensen, which has strangely um, had a little following here in Germany. And it's a fairly commercial kind of um, thriller about a writer. But... That sound back up. <laughs> and the lights down there. What, what, what feels like? To kill someone! Come on, Stan. Feels fucking awful. Daddy has to go now, okay? Well, I'm sorry, you really can't see that, Emmy, can you? Why do they do that, Emmy? Because Daddy's a dad. The Egyptians. Well, they're just a bit boring, aren't they? I'd rather do something a bit more exotic. I was thinking the voyages of Captain Cook. Oh, it's, it's too lightweight. It's too vague, too. He wandered everywhere from the Arctic to the South Pacific. Where's the focus? The focus is this summer's blockbuster. Brad Pitt is Captain Cook. Bit of culture, bit of blood, bit of sex. And that's just in the gift shop, sir. So what is it, Gary? Uh, so that piece is from a British, uh, just yeah, okay. That piece is from a, a British uh, a TV show about a um, a British man who's sent by the National Museum to return uh, some artifacts to New Zealand. Uh, actually, I'll talk more about that later. This piece that you're going to see now is um, uh, from a film called A Song of Good, which is played in festivals around Europe. Um, it's a uh, a story uh, looking beneath the uh, sort of veneer of the culture in New Zealand and telling the story of a uh, fairly undesirable character. Uh, this is the final scene from the film uh, where he's confessing uh, to a woman in his neighbourhood that uh, it was uh, him that raped her. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But anyway. uh, um, I just wanted to come over today to tell you that I'm sorry. I'm sorry about what happened to you. You know? It was me. In there. I feel really bad about it. I don't know what happened. It just happened. I was right about you. You just want to destroy everything good. Get out! What, what, what's wrong? What's happened? Look, Ryan, Ryan, we can get you out of here. But you have to come now. You poison the water? A what? H Hannah's... Baby's... It's gone. Dead. The baby's gone. When you were interviewed in Brisbane, one of the... Uh, that was inside uh, the cult, a scene between a, fa a father and son. Uh, this piece is from an Australian television sh show called Underbelly, which is uh, a true story about the, uh, the rise of, uh, of the drug scene in the 70s in Australia. Um, uh, these two characters, played by myself and Simone Kessel, a Māori girl, are about, uh, uh, Douglas and Isabel Wilson, two um, young New Zealand drug couriers that went to Australia to help bring heroin to Australia in the 1970s through a syndicate called Mr. Asia. Um, he was a Kiwi who uh, became the sort of first drug baron of the southern hemisphere. 
uh, and this is um, shortly before they were found buried in the Australian uh, countryside. Um, yeah, there's your background there. Arresting officers gave me a call to see if there was anything in what you were saying. I don't understand. I mean, we didn't say a word in Brisbane, did we? I didn't sign anything. It was strictly off the record. Tentative identification says the deceased is Harry Lewis, known as Tommy. Look, I already said what I said, OK? I don't see why we should have to go through all this again. Clark is in custody in New Zealand. Right now, he's not a threat to you, OK? This is your best chance to make sure that he doesn't threaten you again. <laughs> With the discovery of Pommy's body, Doug Wilson's interview in Brisbane was finally taken seriously. So what you believed in the sliding scale. Uh, and this is quite embarrassing. This is a, a terrible um, soap opera in New Zealand called Go Girls, which is uh, the most popular show there at the moment. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it does have something interesting about it. It kind of, um, it's very popular with young girls between sort of 18 to 22 uh, who are reflected in the, um, in the show. Uh, I play the... Um, very jealous boyfriend of a, of a big rugby player, big Samoan rugby player, who wants to be an all-black uh, professional rugby player, but uh, you can't be gay and be an all-black. Um, so he uh, has a pretend marriage, uh, and uh, my character, his secret boyfriend, is uh, not particularly impressed by it. So that's what this is, go girls. Triumph of the hits. I don't want you to be hurt. He's lying to himself. But it's not his fault. All the church and family crap that he has to go through. Not to mention the bloody rugby. 21st century still so repressed. Yes. I know you don't agree. Oh, it's not up to me. I'm sorry I tried to make you my forewoman, all right? It was cowardly. Do you want someone else to take over the catering now, maybe? Eli needs my help. And in time, you might even realise that. Oh, there you go. It's embarrassing because I realised that uh, I stole the shirt from that TV show and I'm wearing it right now. Uh, <laughs> that's between us. Um, okay, good. There you go. That's uh, a little introduction to some of my work. Um, uh, it's all fairly... Uh, that's the commercial side of what I do. Uh, but it's uh, inevitable if you want to make a living um, as an actor that you will do a lot of this stuff as well. Uh, okay, so I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, about my country and my culture because uh, I don't think there are any other New Zealanders here. Are there any? No. I think there's an Australian here. I met Sonia the other day. There always is. Uh, okay, so whew, New Zealand is right at the bottom of the world. There's only... Uh, Ushuaia and Argentina is only further south. Um, we're a long way from anywhere. Uh, a country of, uh, of travellers and immigrants. Uh, the first people didn't arrive until the 13th century and they were Polynesian uh, navigators who got lost and, uh, and ended up there. My parents uh, both came from Britain. My father was uh, English. He was an evacuee in the Second World War and his whole family shipped him out to the other side of the world to start again, like a lot of people. Uh, my mother, her family from Northern Ireland. I'm um, a first generation New Zealander, like a lot of uh, Pākehā, New Zealand, European New Zealanders. Uh, our native people are called the Māori people and they're uh, descended from, from a Polynesian group. Um, multiculturalism is only a word that's really been around Fairly recently in New Zealand, I believe, it's always been bicultural has been the word because we have uh, New Zealand Europeans and, uh, and the Māori people and uh, all our art and biculturalism is about bringing these sort of two people together. Uh, yeah, we have a sort of uh, a founding treaty that was signed between the English and the Māori that um, was mistranslated by an uh, Italian missionary. So there's a lot of confusion about it. So the piece of paper doesn't really... Uh, the piece of paper itself, although it's treasure, doesn't have a massive meaning. It's, uh, it's become a cultural... The spirit of the treaty is what's talked about now. So the, uh, the confusions are now uh, constantly debated and reinterpreted by each generation. Uh, I'll give you one example. Um, uh, the word uh, sovereignty was mistranslated in the treaty. Uh, the British Crown, who had come through a lot of other countries and made quite a mess of them on the way, 
uh, we really tried to do things a bit better in New Zealand, but uh, the word that they came up with, sovereignty, which is they said to the native people of New Zealand, you may uh, look after your own stuff, but uh, your, our queen is now your queen. That was translated into kawaiwai tanga, which uh, doesn't really mean that at all. It means you do your thing and we'll do our thing, thank you very much. So um, that's constantly been debated. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, you said you will look after your taonga, your treasures. Uh, what a treasure is has constantly been debated over the years. At the time, it meant uh, uh, your land or your your wealth. Now, uh, taonga has taken to mean uh, your seabed, your airwaves, uh, your language. Um, and there will be new things thought of within the next decade, I'm sure. Uh, language is, crosses over into sort of my territory, really. Uh, the language is a, a tongue, a treasure, and uh, the native language has um, uh, become part of the storytelling of the country. It means that I've been trained in it as well as a storyteller. Okay, so, good. Uh, I, um, I am an actor. I uh, figured out that I wanted to uh, do that fairly early on. Um, when I was a child, uh, our school had to do a play of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and... Uh, None of the girls wanted to be Snow White, uh, partly because uh, if I could define one characteristic about my culture, New Zealanders in general, uh, I was thinking about it this morning, I think it would be uh, humility, uh, humble, humble people, and uh, it, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing um, because we, uh, you know, we let people, everyone gets a chance to speak. Uh, bad thing because uh, if you want to stand up and put your head above the crowd, no, we call it tall poppy. I'm sure you, some of you might have heard this. You know, if one poppy grows too tall, uh, it needs to be cut down. So being an actor, uh, that makes it quite difficult because you're always wanting to stick your head up and talk in front of people. But uh, it's, yeah, it's not encouraged. So yeah, none of the girls in my class wanted to uh, be Snow White. So um, I don't know why. I said, I'll do it. Uh, and my mother uh, got me one of her bras and filled it full of foam and uh, some high heels and uh, I got up on stage and people started laughing and I was embarrassed at first but then I realised every time I tripped over everyone thought it was funny so I would trip over again and they would laugh again and I would trip over again and uh, suddenly I understood uh, instinctually some kind of power that I had <laughs> in that moment and, uh, and that I was bringing something to a whole room of people who didn't know me. Uh, I interpreted it as uh, joy at the time. Uh, but that's where it started, and uh, a lot of people involved in the arts will tell you a story about at some time where they were bitten uh, by something, and that's never, uh, the teeth have never been removed. And uh, that was it for me. Um, I uh, was telling the young leaders the other day, I conducted an experiment. Ow, I've just got an electric shock. I conducted an experiment, um, thought I'd try and be academic as well. Just before I left New Zealand, I asked a whole bunch of my friends, uh, what is New Zealand culture? And uh, this is the first thing that most of them said, uh, the haka. Uh, so this is our national rugby team, the All Blacks. Uh, it's one of the... Um, rugby is... Uh, well, it's kind of a religion in New Zealand. It's played by everyone, uh, women children, uh, brown, white, black, uh, everyone plays it. Uh, I've come to learn that uh, in England there's a little bit of a distinction where the game comes from. Of, uh, it's considered more of sort of a more upper class kind of sport and football. In New Zealand everyone plays it. It's unavoidable. Um, and uh, ever since it's been played, uh, we have incorporated a, uh, a native custom into our, our version of the game called the haka. The haka is a challenge. Uh, it is performed by the national rugby team before the, um, before the game. Uh, it involves a series of movements and ideas that are uh, considered a challenge. Um, I'll get into that anyway. That's the first thing. Uh, my friends gave me three things. They said haka. Here's some uh, fellows performing the haka here. You can see the girls behind them. Uh, yeah, rugby, haka, and barbecue. That's me in my backyard um, just before I came, Christmas in New Zealand is uh, summertime, uh, but because we uh, have inherited a lot of our culture from Britain, we still have roast turkey and potatoes and uh, snowmen 
uh, cardboard snowmen and, uh, you know, <laughs> but it's so hot. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, for the first time this year, actually, I saw a cartoon of Santa at my son's school, uh, and he was wearing shorts and, uh, and jandals. Uh, and I thought, finally, it's, uh, we're starting to develop our own Santa Claus. Um, he, yeah, and, uh, but this is the biggest one of all. Uh, for everyone, it's the land. Uh, we have a large bit of land that we live on. It's about the size of Japan, but only 4 million people live in it, so we have a lot of it. And uh, it's, um, we like to think it's fairly untainted. That's slightly untrue. It's a bit of a myth, but... Uh, there's still a lot of space, and uh, I was thinking about this. You know, like uh, commercials for motor vehicles. I saw a German car ad the other day, and it was very different to a New Zealand car ad, and I was looking at it and trying to think what it was. So I, I went online, and I looked at an American car ad and an Australian car ad, and yeah. <laughs> I have a friend who works in advertising, and there's a new phenomenon now where anthropologists are being brought into... Um, uh, advertising firms to uh, bring research uh, about people's culture to help them figure out how to sell things to them. Um, it's, it's some interesting stuff's coming out. But in Australia, for instance, a car ad uh, is all about getting in a, a big car that is safe and you can conquer the landscape. Uh, and an Australian car ad will have someone in a Land Rover driving through the desert and uh, and over rocks, and because uh, the landscape is dangerous, you know, snakes and spiders, and you need to conquer it. New Zealand, we don't have any snakes or spiders or anything that can bite you. So um, uh, New Zealand car ads are about getting in a car and leaving the city and driving through trees and families having picnic outside their car. And the car, the car is a way to get into the landscape. In Australia, the car is a way to dominate it. And uh, the, the German ad that I saw, it seems to be the... The car is about having lots of buttons and, uh, <laughs> and you know, beautiful engineering and technology and, and things. Yeah, it made sense. But so, yeah, anyway, the land is... Uh, oh, oh we, most Kiwis will carry a piece of land around with them somewhere. This is uh, Ponamu, uh, the greenstone, the jade of New Zealand. Um, so, yeah, I carry a little bit with me when I leave. So that I've always got it. Yeah. Um, but then I was, uh, I was saying I asked um, some locals, uh, a few of the staff at Motel One and uh, a couple of other people, what they knew about uh, New Zealand culture. Uh, and they gave me this. Um, yeah. Well, okay, it looks a little like that, actually, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this has been a massive phenomenon um, around the world and has uh, kind of single-handedly uh, lifted the New Zealand film industry onto a kind of another level where suddenly we have uh, Hollywood in our backyard uh, and now they come all the time. Uh, Avatar, big film, was made in New Zealand as well recently and it's brought with it a whole lot of uh, interesting things. Uh, our film industry is still, still fairly new. The country is still fairly new. It's a really young country. So our cultural identity is still being formed in a lot of ways. Uh, I just got out of drama school when this film ha arrived in New Zealand, and so like everyone else, I went to work on it. Um, none of, no actors got acting work on it. Uh, it was all British and American actors who came here, but um, so we all, all the New Zealand actors, were dressed up as monsters and and elves and things like that. And um, it was fun because I'm sort of you know white and skinny, and I was an elf. And if you're big and brown, you're a Uruk High, and if you're somewhere in between, you're a rider of thingy, and uh, I can't remember the names. Uh, yeah, but it was kind of interesting. We had these sort of completely, we were separated into our different cultures, and then uh, and then became different imaginary species as well. So uh, <laughs> we used to have charade competitions between the Uruk High and the uh, elves because you. <laughs> sitting on a mountain for 16 hours not doing anything. So you spend a lot of time waiting around. On my, my first day on this uh, film, I, uh, I learned the lesson that never volunteer on a film set. Someone came out and said, right, we need a volunteer. I went, yeah! And they uh, grabbed me and said, come this way, come this way, and just sit down here. And I was like, okay, great. Um, it's freezing. Do you want a rug? Yes, thank you. And they walked off. Okay, sat there for a, an hour, a couple of hours, and they came back and said, just lie down. I was like, oh, okay, they lie down then. Someone else came past and stuck an arrow in me and walked off again. And 
couldn't work out where the camera was, and oh, it's way over there. Oh, I'm a corpse. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. But then two weeks later, someone in the stunt team broke their arm, and uh, and so they said, can you uh, can you do a flip or something? And I, absolutely, yep. And just so I became a, a stunt person, and um, and I got trained how to the professional stunt people. They wear this amazing kind of armor. I had a a bucket full of bits of plastic that you just sort of stick down your elf costume and we need someone to fall off that 10 meter Gareth, get up you go um, but it was interesting, the Americans that came to work on the film, they're a very specialised uh, group of people specialised training in America, you train in one thing, they have a heavy unionised uh, industry so you train in this and that's what you do, you don't touch anyone else's stuff uh, in New Zealand it's a history of pioneering people you need to be able to do everything Jack of all trades, we we call it, you know. Um, so on the on the set, you know, you would have uh, Americans as a team. They would come in, they go I'd do this, hands. Another guy would come in and do that, hands. And they would like a military unit. New Zealanders would come in, they go I can't do that. Oh, I better fix that as well. And, oh, but have you got some tape? And like that kind of thing. And it was a real kind of clash of because uh, you got one guy going hands, and another guy's coming and fi- no, 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 don't touch. You can't touch that. And uh, it was uh, fascinating. We had to really learn to um, really work together. And um, yeah, told you I was just going to sort of ramble and tell stories. Um, oh yes, what else have I got? That's right. Look at this. This is uh, Wellington Airport <laughs> just after Lord of the Rings. The government really got onto the back of it, and uh, this is a giant creature called Gollum trying to get the ring here, and this is the airport terminal in, in Wellington. <laughs> it's so embarrassing, they had like a welcome to Middle Earth sign at the airport. Um, but you know, uh, a lot of people uh, on a lot of people ca- come over, you know, dressed as elves and things, and go around looking for elves, but hopefully they find something more while they're, while they're here. Um, we uh, yeah we didn't we didn't have an, uh, a, a union for uh, performers uh, when Lord of the Rings was made. Uh, we have one now, but um, it's <laughs> we thought we would um, you know make some headway. But uh, there's a new film, The Hobbit, just being made, and uh, New Zealand uh, performers were not going to be given the uh, the same rights as international performers, and so we tried to use our new union to make some headway, and we. Um, managed to get a, a general, a worldwide sort of strike on the film from performers. Uh, British actor C. Ian McKellen, uh, who plays the big wizard, he was uh, very instrumental in, in helping us. Uh, so what happened, Warner Brothers, the American film studio, came in and met with the government, uh, our new wonderful right-wing government uh, led by John Key. Uh, they came in uh, and they only stayed for a few hours, uh, but when they left again they had uh, changed the... Uh, changed the law overnight that was rushed through Parliament, and uh, <laughs> and they left with a whole bunch of tax incentives as well, millions of dollars of them. Um, so when you get into bed with a Hollywood studio as a small country, uh, you know you're really playing with the big boys. Uh, my friend, I want to show you this cartoon my friend made. Uh, that's our Prime Minister John Key here. <laughs> that's all, folks. Uh, that's yeah. Anyway. Uh, oh, good, look, I brought some photos along. This, this is me um, as a, a child in my Star Wars T-shirt, dressed as an elderly woman, I think. Um, here's another one of me as a cowboy in my father's tie. Uh, oh, is it? I'm a Mexican, and I'm a ninja. Uh, I don't quite know why I'm showing you these. Uh, I think mo- mostly to, um, to me... Uh, you know, when you're a child, culture is, uh, I don't know, the word doesn't really uh, have much uh, relevance to, a, to a, a child, I don't think. You know, anything is, uh, it's, a, it's a hat, it's a, I was uh, listening to, to Andreas's um, speech before, I was so, I've had this experience over the last three days, it's my second time in Europe and my first time in Berlin, and uh, I was walking around in the, in the Mitte and it was just, Amazing! I was walking around with a massive grin on my face, and then I turned around, and there was a, a memorial to a, a mass grave of 50,000 uh, Berlin Jews in a, uh, this beautiful statue in a, um, a park. And um, yeah, my smile <laughs> went pretty quickly. 
and it, I started looking at everything again, and as I was walking around, I realized that um, the long shadow that he talks about, that Andreas mentioned, uh, exists all over Europe. And we, in New Zealand, we don't really have a long shadow. A lot of Europeans came to New Zealand to get away from this long shadow and won't talk about it. My own um, uh, mother and her, her father uh, came from Northern Ireland uh, with a lot of troubles that I never really got to know about because he wouldn't talk about them because that's gone now. In New Zealand, we're you know trying to forge a you know a new place free of that. And uh, but uh, my generation are starting to look for these stories, and uh, it's coming through in the art as well. But uh, I, I have a Welsh name. My name's Gareth. It means gentle. Uh, and uh, I tell you this because I think uh, a lot of the art that comes out of New Zealand is is fairly gentle, uh, trying to find a way to... Uh, we don't have massive bloodshed to deal with, and we're a long way from it. But uh, we do have our own challenges, and uh, we deal with it in a quite gentle way, and it's mostly coming out through comedy now. Uh, George Bernard Shaw came to New Zealand in the 1930s, and uh, he said a great thing. He said... Uh, they said to him, what do you think of New Zealand? And he said two things. He said, far too many sheep, uh, which is the running gag ever since. Um, the other thing that he said was that you need a film industry and you need it now because without one you will lose your souls without even getting an American one. Um, <laughs> and I mean, he's a brilliant, uh, witty man, but, uh, you know, he was he's right. A, a healthy film industry is indicative of a, of a healthy society and... Uh, is a great chance for you to tell your own stories. And uh, films have a, a long, long, long reach. Um, I failed miserably at school. Uh, like a lot of uh, creative people, school and education can be quite uh, difficult, the way that it's taught in some places by some people. Having said that, I pay tribute to two amazing teachers that I had. My first teacher and my, I think my second day at school, I remember, I'll never forget it, she probably had something she had to do. So she said, okay, children, everyone lie down on the floor on your backs and close your eyes. And she put a, a record on the record player. And uh, it was uh, a rock opera from the 70s called The War of the Worlds uh, based on H.G. Wells about an alien invasion and people were running around and having... Yeah, it's a famous novel, but uh, it was incredible. Uh, she used to read to us, read uh, from novels and... Um, you know, I think uh, we understand that uh, children, their imaginations need to be stretched and challenged. And, you know, you can just dress up. And as children, we get children to dance because their whole bodies are important. And the older you get, it seems your body becomes less important and your head becomes the most important thing. And then just one side of your head. And, uh, yeah, so it was, it was tricky for me. Um, and I understand that there are a lot of highly educated uh, academic people here and... Uh, you know, I pay tribute to that as well, and uh, thank God that you're here for having great thoughts and great arguments as well. Um, but yeah, I think my education mostly came from film, uh, actually. When you're a long, long way from the rest of the world, uh, you access it through film uh, and theatre. Uh, I left school and, uh, and just joined the theatre, really, and uh, I learned uh, most of my compassion and empathy from these plays. Um, People don't write plays about going along and having a cup of tea and having a chat with each other. People write plays about um, conflict uh, or big challenges. You know, we go to the theatre sometimes just to be entertained, same with films, but mostly we go to, uh, to see someone else in a situation we hope never to be in or maybe we've been in and we remember it. But, uh, you know, uh, as a child you're just wearing silly hats, but... Uh, as, as when you get older, suddenly uh, you learn what that hat might represent and who might have worn it. This hat is a cowboy hat. You learn what a cowboy actually is and where they lived and what they went through. Then uh, suddenly, yeah, what does being a woman mean? I didn't care when I was that age. It just meant wearing a dress and having a handbag probably and a flower or something. Yeah. So this is my sort of four-year-old idea about what a woman is. Um, but I have played a, a, a woman in a play um, two years ago, and uh, yeah, that was an extraordinary uh, education. Um, it, yeah, 
<laughs> anyway, um, what else have I got? Oh, look, I put my, made my little sister dress up as well. Uh, yeah, that's how serious I was. I got a close-up. I was obviously going to be an actor. Look, I really believe I'm a ninja right there. I used to, um, my mother used to make me ninja costumes and uh, like with the balaclava and I would ninja out at night and climb into this local swimming pool and hope to meet other ninjas and I never ever did. Um, yeah, uh, there's a, a, one of my favourite Germans actually. I hope he's German or I might have so offended someone. Uh, Albert Einstein, he's German, isn't he? Okay, good. Uh, in the spirit of um, cultural diplomacy, I'm now going to attempt to speak some German. This will be my first time. I have said uh, bitte and danke a lot this week, but uh, this is my first time. And I think he said, Fantasy ist wichtiger als Wissen, denn Wissen ist begrenzt. Right. Yeah. I, hey, thank you. Um, yeah, it's my, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, I was determined to find it in German. You know, uh, ima yeah, imagination is the most important thing. It's more important than knowledge because knowledge, knowledge is everything that has happened and imagination is everything that is going to happen, might happen, could happen. Uh, and, uh, and it starts with, uh, with children. Um, when you, you know, I had my child when I was 17 years old. He's 15 now, plays rugby, very good. Uh, she's about this tall as well. But um, I was telling a story the other day, and I'll tell it again. Apologies if you've already heard it. Uh, we were playing together at the beach, and he was about this deep in a, in a big rock pool, um, putting his fingers and seeing enemies and, and things, and he was going, <laughs> talking away. And uh, he was talking about aliens that lived in the rock pool. And uh, I was just watching him for a while. It was, uh, it was beautiful to watch. And he was totally in his own little world. And I said, hey, what are the aliens doing in there? He looked up at me and, as if I was mental and said, I'm just pretending, Dad. <laughs> They're not real. <laughs> Straight back into it. And, uh, and later when we were driving home, um, he said, rock pools are amazing, you know. They're like, they're so calm on the surface, but there's so much going on underneath, um, just like me. And uh, it's stuck with me ever since because not only, uh, well, he's a genius, not only is, um, is it a, a great lesson in metaphor, <laughs> but also a great lesson in, in acting as well. Um, for me, you know, you, uh, you are pretending at the same time I know that you're there and I know that I'm here, and uh, that it's all a bit of a game. Uh, but you come through it with me. I went to see... Uh, I performed in a production of Hamlet before. It's one of the big formative experiences of my, my theatre career. Uh, uh, just recently, um, there was a film version that the National Theatre in Britain made that I went to see. And then last night I went to see Hamlet at the Schaubun Theatre. Schaubun Theatre? Just um, up the road. Schaubun? Shabuna, danke. Uh, it was amazing. <laughs> so uh, I think Shakespeare's a really important uh, person to me. He always has been because uh, we know next to nothing about him. Uh, a lot of people like to think we know a lot about him. Uh, there's been a lot of writing uh, about him, but we, we know nothing. Uh, you know, he's in 16th century uh, England, even one of the most famous playwrights had nothing written about him. You know, we've, people try to decide what type of person he is by reading his plays, but you can, you know, you can make a decision about him from one play, and then another play will tell you something different, uh, which is great because he belongs to all of us, uh, and they're all very, very old stories. Uh, Hamlet is a classic example because at the end of the day, it's just about a family. Uh, the play is the, each of those plays are reinterpreted by different generations to mean different things. Uh, the British version I just saw um, at the film, on the, they had, it was a filmed version of it. It was all, ab all about cameras and surveillance and spying. There's a lot of spying that goes on in that play. And uh, I don't know if you've been to London, you probably have more than I have. But uh, there are cameras everywhere, and I'm not surprised they would take that theme and draw it out of Hamlet. Uh, this German production, I've never seen such an irreverent, funny version of one of the greatest tragedies in the English language before. No reverence for it at all. Uh, breaking out of character and talking to the audience and ditching the text all the time. Uh, it was fantastic. 
But uh, I think uh, stories about family are the most important stories for all of us. Uh, famous writer, um, Sam Shepard, American writer, was asked why he always writes about families. And he said, um, because what else is there? Uh, there's always conflicts in every family. It's a great metaphor. Okay, what else have I got? Oh, look, this is, uh, I've directed my first play just recently. Um, uh, it's a Scottish uh, political comedy called um, Gagarin Way, named after Yuri Gagarin, the first uh, cosmonaut, first man in space. Um, the playwright Gregory Burke, uh, a Scotsman from Dunfermline, uh, was working in a printing factory. Um, a lot of the, um, the older guys were hardcore socialists and determined to get him to join the union, and uh, he never could. He wasn't interested, and he thought, why am I not interested? Why does socialism hold no interest for me anymore or any of my mates? Uh, so he started to think about it, and he wrote this play. Uh, he's written a second play called Black Watch that's uh, very famous. This is his first one. So he, he wrote a play about two, uh, two factory workers, uh, Gary and Eddie, who uh, decide to kidnap a visiting Chinese uh, executive who's looking at their factory. Uh, he turns out to not be Chinese. He turns out to be from just down the road. And a young security guard who's a philosophy student gets accidentally caught up in it. But we performed it in a Chinese newspaper factory. Um, that's it there. We didn't build that set. That set was already there. <laughs> Uh, there's very little state funding for theatre in New Zealand at all, so uh, yeah, you've got to make do with what you've got. Ow. Um, but uh, I thought it was interesting for us. Uh, Gregory Burke, this play's been done all over the world, and uh, he always gets, because it's a play about socialism, it has Gagarin in the title. People invite him to festivals to talk about it and uh, ply him with questions about the death of socialism. And uh, he said, this play changes everywhere he goes, you know, in, uh, in, in the Polish production. Not funny, not a comedy at all. Uh, you know, the politics had a whole different meaning. You know, in New Zealand, it, we, it was practically a farce. We had people falling over and and things. You know, because uh, socialism, uh, well, the death of it, it barely got going in New Zealand anyway. So uh, it, the idea of, uh, but the idea of trying to make a difference against a, a faceless global. Uh, business or oppression made a lot of sense in New Zealand. I think that's the beautiful power that theatre has, that can be reinterpreted uh, by every culture. Um, but these are things I don't need to tell you. You've all written papers and this kind of stuff. Um, oh, look, there they are again. Oh, yeah, okay, so this is a film still from a film I made called Tracker. Uh, I wanted to show you this because, uh, <laughs> well, it's a really collaborative medium uh, film. And... Uh, so the, I wish I could show you the shot that this actually is. So I'm playing a British, this is me up here, you can't really see. I'm on top of a horse. Goddamn horse. Um, you do this thing when you're an actor and they say, can you ride a horse? You go, yeah, absolutely. I can do whatever you want. Um, this horse had never been on a film set before. It was a champion racing horse. But um, <laughs> film horses uh, in America, if you do a western and you get a film horse, they're beautifully trained, wonderful animals who know how to behave. New Zealand, you know, you get some flippin' racing horse. Uh, so, yeah, I fell off my first day. But uh, So this is a, a film called Tracker that's uh, about to come out in April. Um, it's set just after the Boer War, uh, where a, a Boer soldier comes to New Zealand to um, find out who these people are that came to South Africa and worked for the British uh, and I'm, I play the sort of fancy British officer that uh, takes over the whole show. Anyway, it's a collaborative medium. You can see that this is only a small selection of the people that are there shooting this. This is for like a shot in here. Uh, yeah. All right, look, I'm aware that uh, we're getting close to running out of time, so I'm going to actually try and show you something more interesting. And I'll talk about one more thing, which is uh, my training, because I think, uh, as Mark pointed out, that might be of some interest to you guys. Uh, so I trained at a uh, Takura Tuifakari or Aotearoa, the New Zealand Drama School. Uh, we train our storytellers in New Zealand uh, to learn about the indigenous culture because um, uh, if we're going to go forward as a culture and a country, then it's uh, vital that we uh, understand the, uh, the indigenous uh, 
language and culture. Um, most of our stories, uh, the New Zealand culture is uh, e evolving. Uh, we have fairly harmonious relations, but uh, it's changing now as well. We have a huge Pacific influence, and the Pacific influence has brought uh, kind of their own uh, their own version of hip hop. Uh, Samoan, Cook Island, Rarotongan boys, uh, brilliant rugby players, and have taken over all the, the taken over the game as well now. But we also are starting to have a massive Asian influence in New Zealand, and uh, that's changing things again. And uh, uh, we're finding. Uh, yeah, we, uh, it's given rise to this phrase, uh, my Asian friends call it the banana, where you're yellow on the outside and white on the inside, but you're a fruit that doesn't grow in New Zealand, you know, so they're kind of, uh, yeah, the assimilation idea is uh, starting to become a big issue, but, uh, so at my school, Toi Whakari, uh, you, you, my drama school, you spend three years there and you learn uh, tikanga Māori, you learn haka as a metaphor for performance. Uh, as I was telling uh, these guys the other day, haka is uh, uh, a challenge and a way to uh, present yourself to people. Uh, the, a lot of the principles of... Uh, uh, it's an oral culture, Māori culture, uh, and a very, very physical one too, so it's really useful for performers. Um, uh, the witty witty, uh, for example, the, uh, to show that you have spirit in the shaking of your hands, uh, the challenge from the eyes... Show that I see you. Te nākwe, there you are. It's a greeting in New Zealand. Um, the slapping of, uh, stamping of the feet to uh, show you that I'm here and to expel any spirit from the room. Shaking of the hands, show you that I'm alive. Opening of the eyes to challenge you. I see you. I speak to you. Uh, Tihe Mori Ora is called the sneeze of life. <sighs> so uh, the boys before the haka, you know, you'll see them, and they will slap their bodies and stamp their feet. And uh, we are trained in it as performers so that we understand the, uh, the basic ideas. Um, okay, and with that in mind, I will now show you one thing uh, to kind of finish. Let's see. Nope, done that. Okay, uh, can you hit the lights for me? Hopefully you'll see this a little bit better this time. Come back, there we go. So uh, this is the, the first thing, is um, a Michael Jackson music video. I'll show you a little bit of. You probably, I know you've seen it before. Everyone knows this? Yeah, it's a thriller. One of the biggest selling albums of all time. So I grew up in the 80s, and uh, it was all about thriller. Uh, Check out those moves. Okay. Um, around the same time, there was a, uh, a very old uh, song, Māori song, called Poie, and a, uh, <laughs> a very clever Māori musician decided to bring Poie into pop culture. So they added some 80s music to an old Māori song, and we got Poie. The women are doing poi. The song's called poi air. Poi is the spinning poi, this ball. Outside of Marae, a big, uh, big meeting house, communal house. Uh, and yet no New Zealander could watch this. I would smile from ear to ear. It's a song of my childhood. So, uh, now what I will show you is uh, a friend of mine, Taika Waititi, uh, who is, uh, he's on the jury at the Berlinale this year. He's a filmmaker. Um, uh, I thought I'd show you something that he did that's quite brilliant, is that he took the, uh, the poie and uh, haka and he combined it with his greatest love, which is Michael Jackson. Uh, he made a film about children uh, growing up in the 80s, a film about us, myself, him, our generation. These are the closing credits uh, from the film Boy.
go. Um, yeah, so uh, great. I've, uh, I've gone a little over time, but hopefully if you've got anything you want to ask me. Uh, to be honest, like uh, my experience here at this conference so far, I've found the best um, cultural diplomacy um, has been sort of uh, happening over uh, Uzo and Bear and whatnot. So I would encourage uh, if you have any cultural diplomacy you want to partake in with me, uh, or if any further questions, then uh, that would be the way to do it. But I think we've probably got a little bit of time now to so go for it. First of all, thank you very much, Gareth. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, who would like to pose the first question or comment? Okay. Hi, I'm Judith. Um, I'd like to ask you, you touched upon uh, the issue of Asian influx, mm. and um, from the way you said it, we used to be bicultural, now we're, we seem to be multicultural. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has a kind of a, a slightly negative connotation. So could you please mm. elaborate on this? Um, mm. What are they coming to do in New Zealand, and, and how mm -hmm. how is the situation, how is the reaction to this influx of immigrants? As yeah, well? yeah. I, I'm sorry if it came across as a slightly negative kind of thing, but uh, yeah. No, I understand. Uh, yeah, well, we've always been a multicultural country, like like everywhere, but uh, biculturalism is held up as a... Um, we, we like to think we've done it well. <laughs> it's, uh, the truth is a little more interesting than that, and particularly uh, as artists, I feel a responsibility to um, to challenge these, uh, these things. Um, but... Uh, yeah, uh, we have a, a, a great, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, Asian immigrants coming to New Zealand to study, to learn English there. Uh, it's part of government policy to, to welcome a lot of um, uh, Chinese and uh, Indian, Korean and Japanese students into New Zealand. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out a way to, uh, to um, make uh, Asian immigrants welcome uh, and at the same time to... Um, you know, present New Zealand culture in a way that, you know, things that are expected and whatnot. I'm sure you have these uh, issues all over the world. But uh, um, one thing that's happened very, very quickly, I think, that's interesting is that uh, Asian stories are being told in film and theatre um, and, uh, and also festival, I've always found to be a... Uh, we have cultural festivals that uh, we never really had uh, before... Um, the, the massive sort of Asian influx into New Zealand. You know, we had uh, a lot of Māori kapa haka festivals, which are hugely popular, where everyone's doing uh, haka, and we all go to see and compete in different haka. But now uh, we have these cultural festivals with a massive kind of... Um, because uh, India and China and Japan and Asia have a wonderful uh, history of dance and movement, uh, and, uh, and that's something that's been uh, held up next to haka, uh, and we have these wonderful cultural festivals now where we have uh, we have haka and we have uh, Balinese dance and uh, dragon dance and uh, yeah I think that's uh, one example of how it's uh, kind of working um, yeah the language is uh, the big thing as well you know like everyone is encouraged to learn as much Māori as possible and now Samoan as well but just um, for anyone from an English-speaking nation, uh, Asian languages are particularly difficult to... Uh, the tonal languages are difficult to wrap your mouth around. So uh, being an actor, I believe that language holds a key to a lot of... opening a lot of doors, so I really don't know how that's going to um, continue to work. But children, I think, is the way. You know, kids don't care. <laughs> I think there are a few other questions. Let's yeah, maybe take right. two more, and then maybe a final response, and then we should sure. move on. I'm not sure who is first. Can you help me? You have a better vantage point. Or, uh, uh, back left-hand corner, okay. I think, where all the hands are coming from. Okay. I'm going to have to think about that some more. Didn't really... uh, I had a question very similar to what Judy asked, oh, yeah. so I'm not going to ask the question. One quick comment, though. Ah. Uh, you asked, when thinking New Zealand, what comes to your mind? I think you should also add Daniel Vittorio or Ross Taylor to that list. <laughs> Ross, Ross Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, and good luck in the uh, World Cup. Cricket World Cups just started. Everyone, yeah. Bang Bangladesh uh, girls team are there on tour. It's amazing. Okay. For the final question, I'm not sure who is next. Maybe. Oh, I don't know. I'll give you the, oh, the, the, the difficult choice. Right so down the back, maybe? Yeah. Also in the back, Sorry, right? Okay. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry, I did see you there. I was just wondering if you'd be willing to perform the haka for us. Yes. Yes. 
not not entirely. No, uh, it's a it's a, probably a slightly sort of inappropriate um, uh, situation to do it in, but. Uh, I could teach you uh, a couple of things. Okay, everyone stand up. I'll teach you a couple of things. This is something that I can actually give to you as a performer. Okay. So, uh, hongi means to breathe in. Hongi. Puha. Hongi. Puha. Okay, and the next thing is to a bit of a stance. Spread your legs. And now with your right foot, you stamp. It's called takahia. <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay. And now, uh, witty witty. So we sh- just shake our hands. We let everyone know that you're alive. And now, hongi. Puha. And now you should feel wairua, which is spirit. You start to feel it. So you open your eyes a little bit more. Yeah. That's good. And now, we can all try one more thing. We can try a pukana. And a pukana is a challenge you make with your face. You can use uh, girls traditionally. They make an upside-down smile. I can't really do it. Sort of. <laughs> you open your eyes. You can show your teeth. Nihil. Or you can poke out your tongue. <sighs> so, all right, everyone stop. That's how it's going to go. You ready? <laughs> Wait. Hongi. Puha. Wai wai taki here. Woody woody. Good. And now everyone, on the count of three, will pukana. Make your face. Ready? Tahi, rua, toru, fa. Good. All right. Uh, uh, you yeah, made, made me very proud. 